Chapter 1 Elaine sat at the kitchen table, peeling potatoes, talking happily with her family's cook, Mrs. Jenkins. I'm so glad mother left for the afternoon. If I have to spend one more afternoon embroidering, I'm going to lose my mind. Mrs. Jenkins sighed. She's just trying to do what's best for you. I don't know why she can't see that you're as capable as anyone else is. Elaine frowned at the potato in her hand. It's because she doesn't let me do anything, so she can't see it. She never gives me a chance. She finished the one she was working on, and picked up the next. Whenever she could get away with it, she helped out in the kitchen. She truly enjoyed cooking, although she'd always had to sit to do things most stood to do. Your mother was very afraid you'd never walk again when you fell out of that tree. You really can't blame her for being so careful with you. Mrs. Jenkins had been the cook in her family since before Elaine was born. Of course, after twelve years, it might be time for her to allow you to return to normal activities. I may never be able to dance at a ball, but I can certainly go for walks outside. I can't walk for long, but I'm not a complete invalid. And she was more than a little sick of being treated like one. Even though the doctor had said it was safe for her to do anything she felt up to doing, he mother still expected her to stay inside and do nothing. I know that, and you know that. I don't think your mother will ever believe it. When Elaine was ten years old, she'd been a normal, rambunctious girl with a penchant for climbing trees. She'd fallen when the branch she was sitting on cracked and fallen wrong, landing on her leg. The doctors had mended it as best they could, but her leg had stopped growing, leaving one leg several inches longer than the other. She'd walked with a severe limp ever since, and her mother had treated her as if she were made of glass. Elaine sighed heavily. I need to get out of Beckham and away from my mother. I want to marry and have children, to do everything everyone else in the world does. Even though her leg was short, her mind was the same as always, and she wanted to be treated as an adult, not a child. Mrs. Jenkins turned from the stove. You should. Your mother is never going to let you out of the house long enough to even meet a young man, though. How can you possibly marry? Elaine shrugged wishing she had an answer to that. I don't know. I'll figure it out, though. I have to. Getting out from beneath her mother's thumb was the first order of business. She just hoped it was easier to do than she thought it would be. The kitchen door flew open, and Elaine's mother, Cassandra Phillips, walked into the room, scowling at Elaine. I told you to stay in the parlor while I was gone. Why must you always defy me? She turned to Mrs. Jenkins. I would appreciate it if you would stop giving my daughter kitchen tasks. She's too delicate for hard work. Cassandra picked up Elaine's cane from where it rested against the wall and handed it to her daughter. Come along. Elaine wanted to scream at her mother that she was fine, but she knew better. It was a battle she'd fought for years, but there had been no point. She needed to do as her mother said, or she would be even more limited in what she could do. At twenty-two, she had every right to go out and spend time with other young people, but her mother would never hear of it. Elaine took the cane and casting one last longing look at the work she was leaving behind, she followed her mother into the parlor. Asterisk. The following morning, while her mother was taking her younger sister, Alice, to her dance lesson, Mrs. Jenkins went into the parlor where Elaine was sitting. I have an idea for you, she said, sitting beside the younger woman on the sofa where she was embroidering. What do you mean? Elaine was surprised to see Mrs. Jenkins sitting on the sofa in the parlor. Usually the older woman thought of the family areas of the house as places she didn't belong. She set down her embroidery, happy to have someone to talk to. Even with two sisters in the house, and two married sisters that constantly visited, she felt like she never had the chance to talk to anyone. Her sisters were also involved in dancing and school that she was always alone. 
I was looking over the newspaper last night after my husband finished with it, and I saw something that might interest you. Mrs. Jenkins held out a clipping from the newspaper. Elaine took it, reading over it quickly. A mail order bride? Are you serious? The advertisement read, Mail Order Bride Agency needs women who are looking for the adventure of their lives. Men out west need women to marry. Reply in person at 300 Rock Creek Road. See Miss Elizabeth Miller. Mrs. Jenkins nodded. You should go see Miss Miller. Your mother will be gone for the next few hours, and Rock Creek Road is just the next street over. It's certainly not too far for you to walk. Elaine stared at the advertisement, thinking about what Mrs. Jenkins was suggesting. Could she really do that? Just walk away from everything she knew and go marry a man she'd never met. Was there any other way for her to meet a man and marry? I'm going to go right now, she said, getting to her feet. She took her cane from against the wall and leaned on it. She really only needed it for long walks and not around the house, but her mother insisted she use it at all times. Mrs. Jenkins smiled. Good for you. I think it's the smartest thing you could possibly do. Elaine left the house, breathing in the thick autumn air. She loved autumn in New England and couldn't imagine life anywhere else. As she walked, she wondered where she would end up. Where was there a man who would accept a woman who was broken? Truly, she could do anything any other woman could, but men didn't tend to believe that once they saw her limp. When she reached the house in question, she knocked once on the door, waiting for it to be opened. A tall man in his twenties came to the door, opening it wide for her. May I help you? he asked. I'm here to see Elizabeth Miller. She was surprised by how calm her voice sounded. How could she sound calm when she was doing something that would change her life forever? He nodded once. Come in. He led her down a hallway and into an office. Your name, please? It's Elaine Phillips. He hadn't even asked why she was there. Did people come in all the time to see about being mail order brides? Was she just one in a thousand? Did it really matter? She was doing the thing that was right for her. I'll let Miss Miller know that you're here. He waved toward the sofa. Have a seat. Elaine slowly lowered herself onto the sofa, resting her cane beside her. She massaged her leg near the knee where she'd broken it. It always ached after a walk, but it was a good ache, because it meant she'd done something. She wished she could spend more time outdoors as she had when she was younger. After a minute, a pretty young blonde came into the room and sat down in front of the desk. How may I help you, Miss Phillips? Oh, please call me Elaine. Elaine hadn't met Elizabeth Miller before, which was surprising with how close together they lived. Maybe Elizabeth hadn't lived there for long. I want to be a mail-order bride. She saw no point in beating around the bush. She was there for a purpose after all and she was ready to get down to business. I think I can help you with that. Elizabeth picked up a thick pile of papers from her desk. Tell me why you want to be a bride and a little bit about yourself, and I'll see if I can find someone to match you up with. I honestly need to get away from Beckham and my mother. Elaine shook her head, realizing how rude that sounded. When I was ten, I fell from a tree and broke my leg but it never grew right after that. So one leg is significantly shorter than the other. Ever since my accident, my mother won't allow me to leave the house, or walk around, or do anything. I'm 22 years old, and I refuse to turn 23 living in that house. Elizabeth peered over the papers at Elaine, her eyes going to the cane, beside her. Most of the men who want brides expect their wives to be able to cook, clean, and sometimes help out on the farm. Can you do all those things? Elaine nodded. I only need the cane if I'm going for a walk. I can cook as well as any other woman, and I enjoy being able to move around. My mother would like to tie me up and put me in a glass case, 
and I would like to have the freedom to move around and do something. She knew her voice sounded desperate, but she felt desperate. She had to do something soon, or she would go insane. I understand perfectly. Flipping through the letters, she pulled one out of the middle. I think that John might be good for you. Elaine took the letter and read through it eagerly. Dear potential bride, it's hard to know what to write in this letter. I'm a tall man with dark hair and a mustache. I own a ranch outside Kansas City, and I need a wife. My spread isn't a big one, but I definitely have enough to support a wife and family. My biggest requirement in a woman is that she knows how to work. I need someone willing to cook, clean, and do general ranch work, while I see to the bulk of the ranching. If you think you're up to the challenge of living on the prairie and helping me raise cattle and babies, then you're the wife for me. I hope to hear back from you soon. Sincerely, John Black. Elaine looked up at Elizabeth and nodded with a smile. He sounds like just what I need. What now? Elizabeth handed her pen, ink, and a sheet of paper. Now you write to him, and I'll take it from there. Elaine was thrilled as she wrote her letter to John. Dear John, you sound like exactly what I'm looking for in a husband. I want to have a place to work hard. I enjoy cooking and cleaning, and would not mind helping around the ranch at all. I have blonde hair and blue eyes, and I would love to move to Kansas and help you raise cattle and babies. I hope to hear from you soon. Yours, Elaine Phillips. She handed the letter to Elizabeth who folded it without reading it. I'll send this to him and take it from here. The butler came into the room then, carrying a tray of tea and cookies. Would you like to stay and have some tea and cookies with me? We can get to know each other a little better. Elaine nodded, loving the idea of having someone to actually talk to. She was so tired of being alone. Did you grow up in Beckham? she asked. I've never seen you before. I grew up just outside Beckham. I went to the country school. Elaine frowned. How did you end up here then? In this beautiful house? Elizabeth smiled and told the story of her sister answering an advertisement to be a mail-order bride a few years before. Asterisk. When Elaine arrived home an hour later, she went in through the kitchen door, worried her mother had arrived home and realized she was missing. Is mother here? She asked. Mrs. Jenkins turned around, her face showing her relief. No. I'm so glad you got home before she did. Elaine sank into a chair at the small table there in the kitchen. Let me go fetch your embroidery so your mother can't scold you for working and you can tell me what happened. Elaine waited and took the embroidery when Mrs. Jenkins got back. Thank you. Well, how did it go? Elaine grinned. Elizabeth Miller was very sweet and she had a letter from a man she thought would suit me very well. His name is John Black. She could just envision the man who went with such a name. He'd be tall, dark, and handsome. And he'd be thrilled to have her for a wife. He'd take one look at her and fall in love. She almost laughed out loud as she realized how silly she was being. Where does he live? Elaine explained everything she knew quickly. I sent him a letter, and Elizabeth said I could have a response in as little as three weeks. She bit her lip. I'm not going to tell mother about this until I know whether or not I'm going to him. She said the words hoping Mrs. Jenkins would get the hint and keep quiet herself. I think that's for the best. Mrs. Jenkins smiled at Elaine. You made the right decision, you know. Elaine nodded solemnly. I know I did. Mother won't agree, though. No, she won't agree at all. Asterisk. It was three weeks to the day when Elizabeth called on Elaine, a letter in her hand. Thankfully, her mother was out for the day, and Elaine invited her to sit with her. Mrs. Jenkins, who had answered the door for her, smiled. I'll bring you ladies some tea. 
As soon as Mrs. Jenkins left the room, Elizabeth handed Elaine the letter. I hope it's good news. Elaine eagerly opened the letter and a train ticket fell out. She picked it up with a smile. I believe this means it's good news. She read the letter carefully. Dear Elaine, you sound like the wife I need. Enclosed is your train ticket. I will be waiting at the train station in Kansas City on October 20th. I can't wait to meet you. We will be married as soon as you arrive. Yours, John. Elaine clutched the letter to her chest. It was her ticket out of Beckham and her mother's world. She looked at the date on the ticket and gasped. Why, this ticket is for tomorrow morning. Elizabeth smiled. Does your mother know yet that you're leaving? Her smile said that she knew Elaine hadn't said a word to her mother. Elaine shook her head. I couldn't tell her. She's going to be terribly upset. Her mind raced at how she was going to break the news to her. Could she do it? More likely, she'd have to talk to her father and let him tell her. He knew just the right way to handle her. Would you like me to stay and help you tell her? Elaine was very tempted, but she realized it wasn't the right thing to do. She wanted more independence, and she needed to achieve that on her own, not by hiding behind someone else. I'll tell her. Mrs. Jenkins came in with the tea and cookies then, and Elaine served them both. I'd like to meet you at the train station to see you off in the morning, if you don't mind, Elizabeth suggested. Elaine shook her head. I don't need you to do that. I'll be fine. She'd never gain the independence she needed if she let other people hold her hand every time she had to do something new. I know you don't need me to, but I'd like to. I like to see my brides off as they leave Beckham. Elaine could think of no reason to say no, so she agreed. She hated that the other woman felt like she needed to be watched. That's fine. I'll see you there, then. What time does your train leave? Elizabeth asked. Elaine looked at her ticket. Ten in the morning. I'll meet you there at half past nine then. Elizabeth got to her feet, waving Elaine away. I'll see myself out and see you in the morning. She walked out of the room, leaving Elaine to stare after her. Mrs. Jenkins walked into the room after Elizabeth was gone. She looked at Elaine. Well? Elaine held up her train ticket. I leave tomorrow morning at ten. So soon? How are we going to tell your parents? Elaine shrugged, having no idea. Her father would be easy, but her mother? She did not want to have to deal with her mother. I'm going to go and pack now. Packing was not a task she would enjoy, but she needed to decide what to take and what to leave behind. Not everything would fit into a carpet bag or two. Mrs. Jenkins nodded. I won't offer to help, because I know you can do it yourself. Do you want me to be here when you tell your parents? Elaine shook her head. I'll handle it. She knew Mrs. Jenkins understood how difficult it would be for her. She'd known her too long not to understand. Asterisk. Elaine waited until after supper, when she knew her father would be alone in his study. Knocking on the door softly, she waited for him to call her in. He looked up in surprise when he saw it was Elaine. She rarely interrupted him for anything. Have a seat, he said waving to the chair. David Phillips was a lot more laid back about her injury than his wife was. He never tried to mollycoddle her or try to get her to take things easy. He could see her determination to do everything she'd always done, and he wasn't about to try to stop her from that. She was a good daughter to him, and he would do anything to help her accomplishing her goals. Do you have a minute, father? Elaine was nervous, but she knew talking to her father would be a great deal easier than talking to her mother. I always have time for you. What is it? He leaned back in his chair, giving her all of his attention. I'm moving to Kansas, she said, just blurting it out. I'm going to be a mail-order bride to a rancher there. 
David studied his middle daughter for a moment, his face unreadable. Finally, he nodded. I think that's the best thing you could possibly do at this point. Your mother is never going to let you get away from her otherwise. Elaine nodded. I know she's not. I love mother, but she won't let me even take a walk outside without worrying I'm going to die. I need to be able to live my own life. She was thrilled her father agreed with her. Yes, you do. He sighed, leaning forward. How can I help you make this happen? When do you leave? She swallowed hard. Tomorrow. I thought I'd have more time after I got John's letter back, but it just arrived today. She shrugged. Mother is going to be furious. She hoped he'd offer to tell her mother for her, but she would talk to her if she had to. Leave your mother to me. What time does your train leave? Ten in the morning. She didn't ask for a ride to the train station, because she knew her father would be at work. She could walk. It would be good for her. She needed to get used to being on her feet more after all. I'm going to make some arrangements. I'll drive you to the station in the morning. Elaine nodded with a smile, happy to have her father on her side. Thank you. Are you all packed and ready to go? She nodded. I've done everything. Everything except tell my family. He opened his desk drawer and pulled out some money, handing it to her. If you get there and anything goes wrong, I want you to know that you always have a home to come back to. Thank you. She took the money from him and stood up. I'm going to go upstairs and take a bath before bed. I know I won't have a chance once I'm on that train. She limped quickly from the room, forgetting her cane against his desk. They had moved her bed into one of the downstairs parlors after she was injured, but she still had to go upstairs to bathe. David looked at the cane and smiled, thrilled to see his daughter asserting her independence and not using it for a change. His wife had done her very best to smother the spirit of their most strong-willed daughter, and he was happy to see she hadn't succeeded. Elaine was going to be just fine. Asterisk. After her bath, Elaine sat in her room, brushing her damp hair, trying to dry it. She was in her nightgown, sitting at her dressing table, when the door slammed open. Elaine Marie, what are you thinking? You cannot go to Kansas to marry a total stranger. Her mother had her hands on her hips as she glared at her. I can't stay here and live a quiet life and never go outdoors, mother. I'll slowly go crazy. Elaine kept her voice calm as she answered her mother. I can't let you go. What if you get hurt? Elaine shrugged. Then I'll be hurt on an adventure. I can't sit here and stare at the walls for the rest of my life. Don't you understand that? I need to be doing something, and you've shown me over and over that if I stay here, you're not going to let me do anything. I feel like a prisoner in my own home. Cassandra looked as if she'd been slapped. I've just been protecting you. When I don't watch you, you fall out of trees and hurt yourself. No, mother, I don't. I haven't fallen out of a tree in twelve years. I'm not sure that you've even let me touch a tree in twelve years. It's time for you to let me go. You thought Millicent and Beverly were getting too old to ever find husbands when they were twenty, Elaine said, referring to her older sisters. I'm twenty-two and you won't even let me try to find anyone. She argued calmly, hoping her mother would actually listen to her. You're not well like they are. There's nothing wrong with me anymore. I'm not sick. One leg is just shorter than the other. I've learned to deal with that. Elaine sighed. I'm leaving in the morning. Father has already agreed to drive me to the train station. Cassandra had tears streaming down her face. Will you at least promise to write so we know you're all right? Elaine stood and walked to her mother, hugging her tightly. Of course, all right. I love you, mother. I just need to be allowed to live. 
Cassandra said nothing else as she clung to her daughter for a moment. Do you need help packing? she asked as she finally released her. It's already done. She pointed to the two carpet bags beside her bed. Cassandra nodded once, her face still sad. I guess I don't have a choice in the matter then, do I? Elaine shook her head. No. You don't. I appreciate that you care enough to want me to stay, though. Asterisk. When her father stopped the family buggy at the train station the following morning, Elaine gave him a quick hug. Thank you for driving me. I'll write as soon as I get there and let you know I'm safe. She wasn't certain how far John lived from a post office, though, so she couldn't say when that would be. She knew her father understood. We'd appreciate that. He jumped down to help her from the wagon and handed her bags to her. Do you want me to wait with you? No, thank you. I have a friend meeting me here. Elaine saw Elizabeth waiting on a bench for her. David nodded. You remember what I told you. You use that money and buy yourself a train ticket home if it doesn't work out for you. No need to stay somewhere you're unhappy. I'll be fine. I promise. She knew she would never come home. Even if John wasn't what she wanted, she'd simply find a job in Kansas. She was a hard worker, and she would do whatever it took. The look he gave her told her he understood exactly what she was thinking. He pulled out his wallet and handed her all the money inside it. Just be careful. He was obviously worried about her and not willing to see her work herself too hard. She stared at the money for a moment before taking it and putting it into her purse. She might need it, and she wasn't too proud to accept help if she did. Thank you. He nodded, watching her as she limped away, a look of worry on his face. Dropping onto the bench beside Elizabeth, she squeezed the other woman's hand. Thanks for seeing me off. Elaine had been certain she hadn't needed the other woman there, but now that the time was at hand, she was very relieved to not be alone. Elizabeth grinned. Are you ready? Were your parents upset? Elaine shrugged. Mother was, but father told me that he understands why I'm doing it. He gave me money in case something goes wrong. She didn't mention how much money, but it was more than she'd ever carried at one time. She could live on it for months, and then even get home if she couldn't find a job. That's one of the reasons I wanted to meet you here. If something does go wrong, and you find yourself in a bad situation, don't stay. Get out. Come here or find a place to live there. Whatever it takes. I won't stay where I'm mistreated. Elaine didn't know a lot, but she knew she would never stand for that. She'd put up with being babied for too long. Never again would she stay in a situation where she couldn't be content. That's what I need to hear. Elizabeth nodded to Elaine's bags. Do you feel like you have everything you need? If I don't, my father gave me more than enough money to get it. Elaine sighed. Does everyone get this type of treatment when they leave, or is it just me because of my lame leg? She hated what she felt was special treatment. Absolutely everyone gets it. The woman I took over the business from had a lame leg as well. Elaine looked at Elizabeth with surprise. You didn't tell me that. Elizabeth had seemed to take her leg in stride, and now she understood why. The thing was, with Harriet it just never seemed important. It wasn't overly important to her, so the people around her never thought it was important either. Elizabeth shrugged. Without your mother around, maybe it will become less important to you as well. I hope so. Elaine hadn't really thought of that. She had spent a lot of time trying to prove she could do just what others could, while her mother told her she couldn't. If her mother wasn't there telling her she couldn't, maybe she wouldn't have to keep trying to show people she could. The conductor called for everyone to get on the train then, and Elaine stood to hug Elizabeth. Make sure you write to me as soon as you get there. I need to know you're safe, and everything worked out. Elaine nodded as she walked toward the train. 
When she got to the steps, she waved over her shoulder before getting on. It was her first time on a train, and she was excited. Chapter 2 Colin looked over the shelves in the mercantile, trying to find something he could cook himself. His specialty was beans, but he was so sick of them he was ready to scream. He looked up at the merchant and made a face. You got anything easy to cook? He knew it was pointless even asking, but he had to try. He just wasn't sure he could eat beans for another week without screaming. Colin, you come in here and ask me the same question every week. Every week I say no, and you leave here with more beans and crackers. You need to get yourself a wife. Mr. Judd was a middle-aged man who had once had a full head of black hair. It was now liberally streaked with gray and much of it was missing. Colin wrinkled his nose. He was tall with dark hair and eyes, and wore his black cowboy hat atop his head. He wasn't all that particular about what he ate, as long as someone else cooked it. I'll be back. I'm going to go to the restaurant and find myself something to eat before I buy my supplies. Maybe something will sound good then. He sighed. He was tired of eating at home, but the restaurant cost so much. He felt funny wasting his money on it, but he needed a decent meal for a change. Just find a wife. Mr. Judd grinned at him, his face understanding Colin's distaste with his own cooking. There were many other men in the area who felt the same way. Where am I going to get a wife? Do you know of any unmarried women around here at all? Colin had been in Kansas City for long enough to know there were too many men for the number of women available. All of the women he knew were already married or else they were older than dirt. Well, no, but I know that some men are starting to send back east for brides. Have you thought about a mail-order bride? He pulled out a newspaper and pointed to an advertisement. See? There are people who will find you a bride. You just gotta pay a small fee. Colin thought about it for a minute. I might buy that paper from you when I get back from lunch, but I'm hoping I can just walk into that restaurant and find a beautiful woman sitting there who wants to marry me and only me. He knew the other man was going to laugh at him for even dreaming that way, but he didn't care. Mr. Judd laughed, his laugh deep and coming straight from his belly. He saluted Colin. Sure you will, boy. Sure you will. Colin waved and walked down the boardwalk to the restaurant and found a table in the corner. If there was a lady to be found in the place, he was going to find her. Asterisk. Elaine was exhausted by the time she reached Kansas City and her leg ached terribly. She moved off the platform slowly, dragging her bad leg behind her. She looked all over for a man, but there was only one man by himself in the whole station. He was frowning in her direction. She swallowed hard and walked over to him, stopping in front of him, her hand shaking with her nervousness. Are you John? She asked. She almost hoped he wasn't with the way he was scowling at her, but she had to ask. The man nodded, looking her up and down. Why are you limping like that? Elaine sighed. She really didn't want to get into a big discussion while standing on a leg that could barely support her. A hot bath would make all the difference in the world, but she couldn't have one just yet. Is there somewhere we can sit down and talk about it? Maybe get some lunch? She'd only eaten sandwiches for days on the train, and she was more than ready to eat some real food for a change. John shrugged. Sure, let's go talk somewhere. He turned and led away from the station, leaving her to carry her own bags, and not offering her his arm. She had lost her cane somewhere on the train, and she badly needed it by that point in her journey. She limped along behind him and followed him into a restaurant, watching as he walked back to a table along one wall. She sat down and immediately rubbed her knee. Thank you. She was relieved to be sitting down and have some leg room. The worst part about the entire train ride had been the lack of room to stretch her leg out. What happened to you? 
His face was angry as he asked the question. When I was ten, I climbed a tree and the branch I was sitting on broke. I fell wrong, and my leg snapped in three places. They were able to mend it, but the leg never grew after that. It's the same length it was when I was ten. So now I walk with a limp. She watched his face, seeing that he was getting angry during her explanation. I can do anything any other woman can do. It doesn't slow me down. I lost my cane somewhere along the way, and I just need to get a new one and take a hot bath, and I'll be ready to go. She wasn't sure she'd marry him, though. The way he was looking at her made her feel like he wouldn't be the best choice for a husband. She could move into a boarding house and take her time finding a husband. He shook his head. I said I needed a woman who could work hard in my letter. It's obvious you can't work. Why do you say that? It's not obvious to me. I happen to be a very good cook, and I know how to clean as well as anyone. She didn't know why she was defending herself to him. She could tell he'd never believe anything she said. You lied to me, and I really don't appreciate it. He stood up and walked out of the restaurant, obviously not intending to ever see her again. Elaine took a few deep breaths and wondered what she'd do. She'd only spent a little bit of her father's money, because she hadn't needed more. Surely there was a boarding house around somewhere, and she could find a job once she had a place to stay. She wasn't about to go home with her tail between her legs. She knew she was a strong woman, and she was going to prove it, if only to herself. A waitress came by and asked, What'll you have? Elaine stared at the blackboard where the menu was neatly printed. I'd like a glass of water and a bowl of stew, please. She hoped there was fresh bread with the stew, because that would make it a delicious meal. The woman nodded. Come and write up. Elaine was so angry with the way John had treated her that she could think of little else. She wasn't hurt because she had no feelings for the man, but she was angry that anyone would treat her, or anyone else, as he had. Excuse me? Elaine looked up at the man's voice and looked at him. May I help you? she asked. She really didn't have any desire to be around anyone at that point. Is it all right if I sit here, ma'am? He was tall with thick dark hair and big brown eyes. He carried a black cowboy hat in one hand. Elaine nodded, not sure what else to say. She didn't know him, but if he wanted to keep her company during the meal, she couldn't think of a reason not to let him. Please do. He put his hat on one corner of the table and raked his fingers through his hair. I'm Colin Monroe. She offered her hand. Elaine Phillips. As she looked at him, she couldn't help but wonder what he wanted. She'd never seen a man who exuded so much, raw masculinity, as he did. He made her want to just walk into his arms and let him protect her, which was exactly what she didn't want. It's nice to meet you. He looked at her for a moment as if he were trying to decide exactly why he was sitting with her. I couldn't help but overhear your conversation with John. She looked down, embarrassed that he'd overheard it. So you know him? What else could she say? We're neighbors. His land borders mine, and we share a fence. He looked at her, watching her face. It was obvious she was embarrassed by what had just happened with John, but he didn't think she should be. You didn't do anything wrong, you know. I didn't? She peeked up at him through her lashes. This man, an example of male beauty if she'd ever seen one, had heard another man complaining about her faults. How could she not be embarrassed by that? He shook his head. I assume you came out here as a mail order bride? Yes, she sighed. I'm staying here too. I'll find a job somewhere. Do you know if there's a boarding house in town? She wasn't going to let him pity her. Instead, she'd find a job and show them all that she was a hard worker. Eventually, a man would come along who would appreciate her for who she was. I don't know, but I'll help you find one if you still want one after lunch. 
She eyed him skeptically. Why wouldn't I? What did this man have up his sleeve? Well, I have a ranch, too, and I was just talking to Mr. Judd, the man who owns the mercantile. He told me I need a wife and was telling me about mail-order brides. I was going to go to the mercantile after lunch and get a newspaper that had an advertisement from some mail-order bride agency in it. He shrugged. I think we'd be saving each other a lot of time and effort if we just go ahead and get married. Elaine stared at him in open-mouthed astonishment. Why would you want to marry me? He said he'd overheard her conversation with John, but if he had, why did he want to marry her? He'd never seen her work, so it couldn't be that. What did he see in her? He smiled. Have you ever looked in a mirror? You're one of the prettiest girls I've ever seen. I couldn't do much better, and I heard you telling John that you can cook. He sighed. Honestly? Right about now, I do just about anything to be able to avoid cooking. She grinned for the first time since she'd gotten off the train. You would? At least the man was honest. I hate to cook. All I know how to cook is beans. I eat beans and crackers for three meals a day. Do you have any idea how tired I am of beans? He shook his head in disgust. I swear, if I have to eat one more pot of beans, I'm going to break down and cry like a baby. You don't want to see a grown man cry, do you? She chuckled as the waitress set their food down in front of them. The waitress looked back and forth between them. This one bill or two? One, Colin answered quickly before Elaine had a chance to say anything. When she'd walked off, Elaine shook her head at him. You shouldn't marry me out of pity. I know you heard what happened, and I don't want you to feel obligated to do anything. She couldn't marry a man who just felt badly for what another man had said to her. She had to marry for the right reasons, or not at all. He took her hand in his, holding it tightly. John's a jackass. He's the kind who would drown his own kid if he was born with a hair color he didn't like. You'd be much better off with me. He brought her hand to his lips, kissing her fingertips. You would have married John, who was a complete stranger. At least you've seen me. He was very attracted to the pretty girl beside him, and he saw a strength in her that he couldn't discount. She was obviously going to be a hard worker. He could see it in her eyes. But, you don't know me at all. She looked down at her stew. You must not have heard the entire conversation. I have a leg that doesn't work right. She hated pointing out her faults to the man, but she couldn't let him think he was marrying a woman with no problems. He needed to understand what he'd be getting out of the deal. I heard. I also saw you walk in here, carrying your own bags after how long on a train? Just over three days, she said, her voice tired. She needed to walk around to exercise her leg whenever she could, or it just got worse and worse. So you spent three days on a train to come and marry the man, and he couldn't be bothered to even carry your bags for you when you got here? That's not the kind of man a pretty lady like you should marry. Colin looked deep into her eyes, astounded by the clear shade of sky blue they were. Forget him and marry me. She laughed. You don't want to marry me. You just, feel bad for me. She was tempted to say yes and see how long it took him to run from the restaurant. He sighed, shaking his head at her. I do feel bad for you. I feel bad that a neighbor of mine left you in a restaurant in a town you'd never been to instead of marrying you like he promised. He took a sip of his water, watching her over the top of the glass. If you tell me you're going to get on a train and go right back home to wherever you came from. Massachusetts, she said. Why she felt the need to tell this man anything about her, she didn't know, but she was strangely attracted to him. So if you tell me you're getting on a train and heading back to Massachusetts, I'll just walk away and go back to the mercantile and write the mail order bride agency and ask for a pretty blonde with the bluest eyes I've ever seen. I'll insist that she's from Massachusetts, 
and her name has to be Elaine Phillips. He looked at her. Please save me the time. He felt sorry for her, because of what John had done, yes, but that wouldn't have been enough for him to ask her to marry. She was beautiful, and if she could really cook, then he would be in heaven. She shook her head at him, laughing softly. I do believe you're serious. And suddenly she wanted him to be serious. She wanted to marry this man and stay in Kansas. You've never met a more serious man in your life. Please, let's go see the preacher, and then we'll go to the mercantile, and you can pick out all the glorious food you're going to feed me. He grinned at her, and it reminded her so much of a little boy she had to laugh. All right. I'll marry you. She wondered if he'd expect her to share a bed with him, seeing as how they'd only just met. Of course, she'd have shared a bed with John, so she couldn't expect to not share one with Colin. Could she? Would you, would you expect me to share your bed? Her words came out in a rush, and his smile widened. He tilted his head to one side, considering. Well, I'd want you to. I won't lie about that, but you seem awfully tired. How about this? I'll give you two nights to settle in good, and we'll plan on sharing a bed after that. You have time to feel better, and then I get what I want. She considered his words, thinking he was being more than fair. Her mother, despite her anger, had explained about the marriage bed before she left, so she knew what to expect. That sounds fair to me. She held her hand out to him to shake on their deal. He ignored her hand and threw some coins on the table for their meal, standing up and taking both of her bags in one hand and offering his other arm. They left the restaurant and he quietly led her into a gap between the buildings that was quite dark and not visible from the street. He set her bags down and turned to her. I'm not going to shake on a deal with the lady who is about to become my wife. He caught her waist and pulled her to him, his mouth coming down on hers, kissing her sweetly. Elaine had never been kissed before, and she quickly sucked in a breath as his lips descended on hers. She'd never even thought about how a man's kiss would feel, and she was surprised at the softness of his lips. She wrapped her arms around him and clung to his broad shoulders, astounded at the tingling sensation rushing through her body. When Colin raised his head, he looked deeply into her eyes. Not sure I can wait that long, sunshine. Elaine stared up at him, her tongue coming out to lick her lip. She could still taste him. Sunshine? No one had ever used a pet name with her before, and she found she liked it. Your hair is the color of sunshine. He stroked her cheek lightly with one finger. Let's go get married before some other man sees you and tries to steal you away from me. He brushed his lips across hers one more time, certain waiting even two nights to make love to her was going to kill him. She laughed, shaking her head. I don't think that's something you need to worry about with my bum leg. I haven't seen your legs yet, but I'll bet they're as beautiful as the rest of you. If you want to, you're welcome to show me later. He wagged his eyebrows at her, making her blush. She shook her head. You're being very naughty, Mr. Monroe. And she liked it. Why did she like it? He smiled, holding his arm out to her again, noting that she was needing to use his arm to help support herself. He walked slowly toward the pastor's house, knowing the man would marry them with no problem. Do we need to get you a cane when we go to the mercantile? He didn't want her to be in pain for any longer than absolutely necessary. She nodded, not wanting to admit it, but knowing she had no choice. I have my own money. I can pay for it. She wouldn't be a financial burden on him. She didn't want to tell him yet about the money she had stashed away, but she was more than willing to use it for a purchase that would only benefit herself. Colin shook his head. You're about to become my wife. Let me buy you what you need. He looked up and realized the pastor's house was well past the mercantile. Let's stop and get your cane before we get married. We can come back to get the supplies we need afterward. 
He hated the idea of her being in pain even an extra minute. If the cane would help, he could put the wedding off for a few minutes. She nodded gratefully. Thank you. She wasn't sure how much longer she could walk without a cane, but she hadn't wanted to tell him that. Don't thank me. It's what men do for their wives. He pushed open the door to the mercantile and held it for her. Mr. Judd was watching them with white eyes. Mr. Judd, this is my fiancé, Elaine. Elaine, this is Mr. Judd. He owns the mercantile. Colin's eyes were dancing with laughter as he saw the look of astonishment on the older man's face. Mr. Judd shook his head as if confused. Your fiancé? Colin shrugged at the merchant. You're the one who told me to find a mail-order bride. I did. He walked to the display of canes in the corner and frowned. None of them are good for a lady. He chose the shortest one that would be the right length for her. I'll make you one just as soon as I have time, but this will do for now. He hated that there were no pretty canes he could buy her. She accepted it gratefully and used it as they walked to the counter, nodding shyly to Mr. Judd. We'll be back for supplies right after we go to the preacher's house to get married. Colin leaned forward as if he were imparting a secret. She can cook. Mr. Judd laughed, smiling at Elaine. Well, I think she'll be a fine wife for you then. Colin smiled at her. I know she will. He paid for the cane and they moved down the boardwalk toward the pastor's house. Once they reached it, he turned up the path and knocked loudly on the door. Elaine was clinging to his arm with one hand and leaning heavily on her cane with the other. When the pastor opened the door, Colin smiled at the older man. Pastor Samuels? We'd like to get married. Pastor Samuels looked at Elaine with a smile. Come in. He opened the door wide, stepping aside for them to walk in. Elaine saw by the look in the pastor's eyes that he noticed her limp, but he said nothing. Once they were both inside, Colin set her bags down and they stood before the preacher who, after asking her name, invited his wife into the room to witness the ceremony. Elaine was surprised by how quickly it went. One minute she was stepping off the train to marry John, and the next thing she knew, she was marrying Colin. She knew she'd gotten the better man, not only by how he treated her, but by how he treated others. She'd noticed that John didn't seem to look at anyone, and people tended to give him a wide berth. Everyone seemed to smile and wave at Colin as if they all knew him and respected him. She was pleased that she'd done so well for herself after all. When the pastor said they were husband and wife, Colin pulled her to him and kissed her sweetly, just barely brushing his lips across hers. Elaine wanted more, but she didn't know quite what more she wanted. Colin pressed some money into the pastor's hand, and they walked to the street and stopped at his wagon to put her bags in the back. I should have put them there when we passed a little while back, but I was too excited about marrying you. He waggled his eyebrows at her. Being with such a beautiful woman seems to steal my senses away. She blushed, watching the way the shirt he wore stretched taut across the muscles of his back. He was a very handsome man, and she still couldn't quite figure out why he'd chosen her for his wife and not someone else. Do you need to rest in the wagon for a moment before we shop, he asked quietly, not wanting anyone else to hear, because he could tell it embarrassed her when attention was drawn to her infirmity. She shook her head. No, let's just get it done, and then we can go home. It felt strange calling a house she'd never seen home, but it was the only place she had now. He led her into the store again, and she looked around. I don't know what you already have. How could she buy supplies when she couldn't take inventory? She didn't know what pots, pans, or cooking utensils he had. She wanted to just go back to the house so she could look around and come back the following day, but she had a feeling that wouldn't go over well. Mr. Judd walked over, shaking his head. You don't need to worry about that. He has nothing but beans in his house. 
I know, because I'm the one he buys everything from, and he never buys anything but beans and crackers. Elaine bit her lip to keep from laughing. He's already told me he doesn't ever want to eat beans again, so we'd better start from scratch. She simply had to point to something and Colin would place it on the counter for her. They had a huge pile of goods by the time they were ready to leave. Finally she looked at him. Do you have pots and pans and dishes? Or do we need to get those as well? He shrugged. I have some. He had no idea what she needed so he didn't know how to tell her what he had. Do you have a bread pan? A big pot for soups and stews? I think I have a bread pan, and I know I have a big pot, cause that's what I use for my beans. Mr. Judd put a large box filled with bakeware on the counter. Don't let him fool you, Mrs. Monroe. He has nothing. Elaine looked at Colin with one eyebrow raised. He shrugged like a child, obviously having no idea what he had. She sighed. We'll take that as well. She smiled at him. Do you have curtains? Tablecloths? The picture she was getting in her mind of his house was something completely bare and hardly livable. He shook his head. I've never really needed them. I'm going to buy fabric to make them with my own money, she told him, walking to the fabric and picking out some pretty blue gingham. You obviously don't care about them, and I do. She needed her home to be a place she'd be happy to entertain in, even if she didn't know anyone. After she'd carried the bolt of fabric to the counter and placed it with everything else, Elaine was almost embarrassed at the quantity of supplies she was buying. If he really only had beans and crackers in his house, all of it was necessary. She wished she knew if she was getting too much. Mr. Judd found Elaine a chair to sit in while he and Colin loaded the wagon. She felt as if she should be helping, but she had to admit, if only to herself, that she couldn't. She was at her limit, and if she didn't get into a hot bath quickly once they reached his house, she was going to be in a lot of pain. She hoped he had indoor plumbing as her family had in Massachusetts, but she didn't ask. She didn't want him to think she was pampered. You ready? Colin called from the doorway, and she got to her feet, moving slowly and stiffly. As he watched her move, he hurried across the store and swept her off her feet. Colin, put me down. She hoped no one had seen him. What was he thinking carrying her around that way? People will see. She looked about her frantically hoping no one was looking at them. My wife is in pain, and if I can help her pain, I will. He carried her to the wagon and gently placed her on the seat, hurrying around her and climbing up beside her. He waved his thanks to Mr. Judd and drove away toward the outskirts of town. She looked around her at the town, noticing how different it was from Beckham. How far out of town do you live? she asked, trying to make conversation. It takes about thirty minutes to get home from here, so just a few miles. He liked how close he was to town. It was an easy drive when he needed to go, but not so close that people from town were always on his doorstep bugging him. How often do you come to town? She thought for the first time about how isolated life on a ranch would be. Would she only see other people one or two times per week? However it was, it couldn't be worse than feeling like a prisoner in her mother's parlor. He laughed. Every Sunday for church, and again every time I run out of beans. Elaine shook her head. I will do my best to never cook beans again. What kind of beans do you cook? All different kinds? Beans were such an inexpensive meal that she hated taking them out of their diet, but she couldn't cook anything that made him sick to his stomach. I only know how to cook pinto beans, so that's all I've eaten. Well, then we can add other beans into the mix. She smiled as they left the town and she saw the open prairie ahead of her. It's pretty here. She stared out at the prairie and smiled as she saw a river running along the road to the north. He smiled, slipping his arm around her shoulders and pulling her close to him now that they were out of town. 
I love it here. The prairie is quiet. I'm primarily a cattle rancher, but I have a couple of cows for milk and some chickens for eggs. He shrugged. What more could I need? You have eggs and milk, but don't know how to cook with them? What kind of person didn't know how to cook the food he raised? Well, I drink the milk, and I figured I'd eventually figure out the whole egg thing. Just never got around to it. She was surprised at that. So what do you do with the eggs? Feed them to the chickens. Elaine sighed. You feed the chickens' eggs to the chickens. Really? Colin shrugged. I don't know what else to do with them, and chickens will eat just about anything. They're like pigs. Will you teach me to milk the cows and collect the eggs? I don't want to feel like I'm not doing my share. Helping around the ranch was one of the things she'd moved to Kansas expecting to do. She wasn't going to let up until he taught her what to do. He frowned. I don't like the idea of you milking the cows, but I'll teach you to collect the eggs. She folded her arms over her chest and glared at him. And just why can't I learn to milk the cows? If he told her that her leg wasn't up to it, she just might show him how strong her leg really was, by kicking him. I don't want my wife to get hurt. Cows kick sometimes. Do they ever kick you? She watched him as he answered her, ready to detect any lie he might be telling. Well, no, but they're used to me. She took a deep breath, trying to keep her anger reined in until she was certain he deserved it. If you were married to a woman who didn't have the injury I have, would you let her milk the cow? He thought about her question for a moment, realizing it was a sensitive issue for her. I honestly don't know. I don't think I would, but I don't know. She nodded. Thank you for not lying to me about it. He turned to her, kissing her forehead. I will never deliberately lie to you. I may sometimes do it inadvertently, but never on purpose. Thank you. This is where my land starts. He pointed to a fence made of barbed wire. It's still going to be a little bit of a drive to the house, though. She looked out over the land, spotting a large group of cattle standing together. Are those yours? She was starting to get excited. Cows. Real cows, and she would have a say in how they were raised. At least she hoped she would. He nodded. They're ours. He squeezed her tightly with the arm still wrapped around her. She smiled. I'm going to need a hot bath when we get to the house. My leg isn't going to hold up for much longer if I don't get one. She hated having to admit to it, but she knew it was the only thing that would make it so she could cook even one meal that evening. Colin frowned. I have a pump in the kitchen, and we'll need to heat up the water. I can do that for you while you rest if need be. He hated that she was in pain and was willing to do anything he could to help her. Elaine shook her head. Sitting in the wagon on the way out will be enough rest. I'll put the supplies away while I heat the water. You can go out and work. She hoped he'd listen to her, because she really didn't want to have to take a bath in front of him. He grinned. I don't mind. I'll even soap your back for you if you need me to. She blushed. I don't think that will be necessary. She knew she'd wasted a lot of his time that day. How late do you usually work? He shrugged. It really depends on the day. I like to have supper around five or six if I can make that happen. He'd never been good about being on a routine, but he liked the idea of a wife helping him to stick to one. She nodded. I can definitely help you with that. She saw a small house in the distance. It was made of wood, and much smaller than what she'd grown up in, but she'd had four sisters, and there had been servants everywhere. It would be just the two of them. Do you have a family? she asked. He pulled up in front of the house and walked around to help her down. I do. They're all back east, though. My parents are still in North Carolina, and my brothers and sisters are scattered all over. 
One brother is in Maine, another in Kentucky. My sister stayed close to home, though. I never thought to ask. How old are you? She couldn't believe she didn't know the age of her own husband. What kind of wife didn't know that? I'm 28. I moved out here when I was 21. He started carrying things into the house while she walked inside and looked around. It was very small, but it would be cozy. There was a big room at the front of the house that served as kitchen, living area, and dining room all at once. There was a small bedroom at the back of the house, with a bed big enough for two people, but just barely. Where would she sleep? He'd promised her two nights. She bit her lip, trying not to fret over the inconsequential detail. She could see the outhouse out one of the windows, and that answered her question about whether there was an indoor bathroom. Apparently, she would be going outside to attend to her needs. That was one thing she would really miss, she knew. A bathroom was something she'd always had back in Beckham. She hurried to the basin and pumped water into a large pot, putting it on the stove. She peeked into the stove and saw that the fire needed to be started. Knowing there was no way she could manage to kneel down to do it, she waited for him to bring in a load of supplies. Would you mind starting a fire for me? His eyes widened with understanding. Oh, I wouldn't mind at all. He carried a few logs of wood over from the box next to the front door, frowning as he looked at it. He kept it there because it was easier to carry the wood to just inside the door, but he could see it would need to be moved. Her convenience was so much more important than his. He knelt down and started the fire, getting to his feet. Anything else? She shook her head, touching his shoulder. Thank you for helping me. She walked to the work table and put away some of the supplies they'd purchased, trying to decide what she would cook for their supper. I won't always be so helpless. He stared at her in surprise. You're not helpless at all. You helped me with purchasing things in town. You've done everything I expected of you. In fact, I think you should sit down and let me heat the water. You can put the supplies away after your bath. She shook her head. I'm strong. I can do this. She wouldn't let her new husband down on her first day of marriage. She couldn't do that to either of them. He brought in the tin tub from where it was resting up against the side of the house. Why did you come here as a mail-order bride? Why not stay back east? He glanced at her as he asked. She flushed, not wanting to answer him, but not willing to lie to him either. From the time I broke my leg, my mother has treated me like an invalid. If I so much as walked into the kitchen to sit at the table and peel potatoes for our supper, she'd become angry and make me go back to the parlor to do embroidery. I was allowed out of the house to go to church, but she stayed beside me. She wouldn't let me wander around and talk to the other young people. I'd pretty much been a prisoner for the past twelve years. Our family's cook, Mrs. Jenkins, saw an ad for a mail-order bride, and she brought it to me knowing it may be the only way I would ever get out from under my mother's thumb. I loved the idea, and jumped at the chance. I didn't tell my parents that I'd sent the letter off until the day before I was to leave Beckham, though, because I knew my mother would do everything she could to keep me from leaving. He looked at her with surprise. But you left anyway? She had to be strong-willed to go against her mother that way and strike out on her own. He was very impressed, because he knew few women who could do that. I had to. I talked to my father and told him, and he dealt with my mother. He said he thought it would be the only way I would ever find happiness. Colin walked across the room to her and pulled her into his arms, holding her close to him. I can't promise that I'll always be easy to live with, or that I'll be the best husband in the world, but I do promise that I will not keep you from doing things you're perfectly capable of doing. He kissed the top of her head as he held her. She smiled against his shirt, inhaling his scent. I think I was meant to marry you. John wasn't ever meant to be my husband. 
Apparently, John wasn't meant to be anyone's husband. He laughed. I hope you still feel that way after our first argument. She looked at him in surprise. Are we going to argue? Her parents hadn't really argued much, because her father hadn't allowed it. Colin shrugged. I come from a long line of hard-headed argumentative people. If we don't fight, I'm not sure that I'll feel like I'm really married. She laughed. My parents never fought. They had discussions. Mother told father how she thought things should be, and he either said yes or no. That was the end of it. Elaine, I'm not your boss. I believe marriage is an equal partnership. If you don't like something, you need to tell me. Your opinion will always matter to me. She nodded smiling. My water's boiling. She rushed to the stove and picked up a towel, carrying the pot to the tub and pouring it in. She refilled the pot and started the process again, knowing it would be faster this time, because the stove was already hot. I'll carry in the rest of the things, he told her. He couldn't think about her bathing in his kitchen. He so badly wanted to stay there and watch her bathe that he knew he needed to just get out. She had the tub full by the time he had everything they'd purchased scattered between the work table and the table. I'll probably just cook something simple for supper, she said. I'll be able to do a lot more tomorrow. I'm not always this worthless. Colin shook his head. You're not worthless to me. He walked out the door and unhitched the wagon, getting his favorite riding horse from the stall. He needed to go mend some fences for a while so he wouldn't think about his beautiful wife getting naked in his kitchen. Chapter 3 By the time Colin was home for supper, she'd done up the dishes he had in the sink, put all the food away, and cooked pancakes with the bacon they'd purchased at the store. She was pouring milk into two glasses when he walked in, her hair was still damp in the long braid she had it in that went all the way down her back. He greeted her with a kiss on the cheek and took one of the chairs. She put the pancakes and bacon on the table, along with fresh maple syrup, and sat across from him. There was no butter to be found, so she knew she'd need to churn some the next day. There was a lot of work to be done, but nothing she couldn't handle. Is there anything special you want me to do around the house, before I do a deep cleaning and start sewing curtains and tablecloths? He shook his head, watching her closely. He could see she'd done a lot of cleaning, and she didn't look like she was any more tired or limping any worse than she had earlier in the day. Not a thing. You've done a good job on the house. Elaine smiled. It was fun cleaning something that's mine. She poured some syrup over her pancakes and handed the bottle to him. He poured his own. Will you say our blessing for us? He took her hand in his and quietly prayed over their food. You need to let me know if you want to cook anything special. I can kill a deer or one of the pullets. I don't mind hunting for you. He liked the idea of seeing her in the kitchen cooking meat he'd killed with his own hands. It made him feel like a good provider. She shook her head. Not just yet. We have the salt pork we bought today, and there's plenty of bacon. Between those things and the vegetables, we'll be set for a while. She took a bite of her pancakes. How often do you usually butcher cattle? He shrugged. I never have, but most ranchers tend to do one every fall and every spring. I raise mine and sell them. Now that I have a wife, I'll start butchering them on occasion as well. It would be nice to have them to eat. They keep for a while in the cellar, and then we'll have to cure it. I'll try to get meat all through the winter. He was looking forward to eating more than beans through the winter, and he smiled at Elaine, thrilled that she would be there to share meals with him, good meals that he hadn't cooked. I'd appreciate that. I'm not the most creative cook, because I don't have a lot of experience, but I do like to experiment with food. I think I should be able to cook just about anything you bring me. 
She was confident in her abilities because of the hours she'd spent working with Mrs. Jenkins in the kitchen while her mother had been out of the house. I'll enjoy testing you on that. He grinned. Come spring, we'll put in a kitchen garden so we won't have to buy everything from the mercantile. He could just picture them working together to put in a garden. He loved the idea of working together on just about anything, especially making babies. She smiled. I'd like that a lot. My mother was always worried about letting me go outdoors. When I was a girl, all I did was run and play and after I hurt myself, I wasn't allowed to do anything. The doctors kept telling her that I'd be better off if she let me get fresh air and keep my muscles built up, but she would never listen. She sighed and shook her head. She really acted like I was a broken doll after it happened. We'll do it together. He felt a great deal of anger toward her mother, even though he understood she was just trying to protect Elaine. She'd obviously done a great deal to break his wife's spirit while she'd been working to keep her from hurting herself. Thank you. She knew he would find it odd that she was thanking him, but she didn't care. She finally felt like someone had some confidence in her, and it meant everything in the world to her. After they finished eating, he dried the dishes while she washed them. You don't have to help me with the dishes, she protested. She hated that he was helping with a job that should be hers. He couldn't work all day on the ranch and come home and do her chores at night. She needed to be a helper to him, not a burden. I won't most nights. Tonight, you're really hurting, though. I don't know if it's a normal thing or because of the walking we did or the long ride on the train. Whatever reason, I'm not going to make you stand here alone to do them. Colin reached for another dish and dried it. He didn't care if she argued with him. He wouldn't feel truly married until they'd survived their first argument anyway. Elaine wanted to argue, but she swallowed hard instead. He was right. Thank you. He leaned over and kissed her cheek. You're very welcome. Once the dishes were done, he looked around for a moment. I'm not sure where I'm going to sleep tonight. I guess I can find some blankets and make a pallet on the floor. I don't have my winter quilt out yet. He looked a little lost as he said the words. Elaine bit her lip. I wouldn't mind if we shared the bed. Just so you don't have to sleep on the floor. She looked at the floor in embarrassment. I'm probably too sore to do anything, though. She couldn't make him sleep on the floor. It was his bed after all, and she couldn't do that to him. He smiled at her. I appreciate that. I'll do my best to keep my hands to myself. She limped into the bedroom and looked at the bed that hadn't been made yet that day. The sheets and blankets needed to be washed, but that would have to wait until tomorrow. She could see now why John had rejected her. There was a lot of work to be done, and she really may not be able to do it all. Squaring her shoulders, she held her head up. She'd do it, and she'd do it so well, no one would know what happened to them. She smoothed the covers, looking over her shoulder at him. Would you bring my bags in, so I can change for bed? She hated asking him to do anything else, but her leg would barely make it to the outhouse and back. Colin rushed from the room and came back with both of her bags. When she looked at him waiting for him to leave, he just looked back at her. Finally she sighed. I'm not going to change in front of you. She felt like she was a mother scolding her child as she told him. He should know better. He shrugged. I don't see why not. We're married, and I'm going to see you with no clothes on eventually. He watched her expectantly. She folded her arms over her chest and glared at him. Eventually is not right this minute. Please go find something to do while I get ready for bed. He walked closer to her and took her by the shoulders, turning her so her back was to him. He carefully undid all the buttons that ran up and down her back. I've wanted to do that all day. I'll go now. 
He walked from the room, thinking about the bare flesh he'd seen above her petticoat. His finger had accidentally grazed it, and her skin had been so soft. Two nights. He could wait two nights, right? Elaine stood with her dress clutched against her chest for a moment. What was that about? She mumbled, before quickly undressing and pulling her nightgown over her head. She slid between the covers and moved to the spot closest to the wall, thinking he would want to be the one on the outside, and it would be easier if he didn't have to climb over her. When he returned, he blew out the lantern and removed his clothes, slipping into bed beside her. He pulled her into his arms and held her against him, his hand stroking her side through the nightgown. When she started to protest, he said, I'm not going to do any more than kiss you and touch you. I promise. He couldn't lay beside her and not kiss her though. He felt he'd die if he couldn't touch her just a little bit. Elaine looked up at him. The room was dark except for the stream of moonlight coming in through the window. She could see his dark eyes looking down at her. I guess that's all right, she said shyly. It felt strange to allow any man to touch her the way he was, even though he was her husband, and she knew it was fine. If I do anything that you don't like, you just let me know. He slowly lowered his head to kiss her softly, his lips toying with hers, but not making any demands on her. His hand stroked down her side, moving to her back and pulling her closer against him. He hadn't put on anything to sleep in, so he could feel her breasts against his chest, through her thin nightgown. She moved her arms around him, clinging to him, her hands discovering his bare skin. At first, she started to move away, but then she remembered his words. They were married, and she would have to get used to his touch sometime, right? She explored his back with her fingertips, her hands moving over the hard muscles there. Why did she enjoy touching him so much? He pressed his lips harder against hers, his tongue tracing her lips, until she parted them and he could move it into her mouth. His hands roamed up and down her back at first, and then they moved around to her sides. You feel so good, he whispered. She pressed her lips to his neck, her tongue moving out to taste his skin. She'd been tantalized by his neck all day, wondering how it would taste. She'd never thought of such a thing in her life. Why was she thinking about touching him and kissing him when the idea had never occurred to her before? I like the way you taste, she whispered as he shuddered against her. You're killing me. He sighed and kissed her one last time before rolling to his back, pulling her head down on his shoulder. Maybe kissing you wasn't the best idea I ever had. He was panting as he forced his body to calm down. He had promised her she would have two nights, and he would give her those two nights if it killed him. Elaine lay for a moment in the darkness, wondering what she'd done wrong. She was close to tears when she finally asked, Did I do something wrong? She didn't want to ask, but the way he was acting, she knew it was something. If she didn't ask she'd never know what it was. He pulling her closer, hugging her tightly. No, of course not. I just, I don't want to stop, but I promised, so we need to just lay here. He hated the sorrow he heard in her voice. She thought about his words for a moment, before her eyes widened in understanding. He was interested in her. Physically. She couldn't believe a man could see past her hurt leg to want her physically. She hadn't believed it was possible. I'm glad you want to do that with me. Colin looked at her with astonishment. Of course, I do. I wouldn't have married you otherwise. Had she really thought she was just a charity case to him? She was one of the most beautiful women he'd ever met. Do you not have any idea how pretty you are? He looked at her. Do they not have mirrors in Massachusetts? Elaine shrugged. No one has been able to see past my leg since I was a little girl. She paused, trying to think of the best way to put it. I didn't just have a hurt leg, I became the hurt leg. Even my mother never saw my personality any longer, 
She only saw the leg and made all kinds of rules to keep me from doing any further injury to myself. She hated it, but it was fact. He was able to see past her leg, and it made all the difference in the world for her. Colin was truly a good man, and he'd make her the best of husbands. She knew it with everything inside her. I see you as so much more than your leg. He stroked her hair as he spoke. Do you want to know what I see when I look at you? She nodded, half afraid, but she knew he wouldn't deliberately say anything to hurt her. I see a very pretty lady, who is sweet, well-mannered, can cook like a dream, doesn't mind hard work, and who is willing to put up with my ways. She also just happens to have a hurt leg. He leaned down and kissed the top of her head. She makes my heart beat faster, and I want to carry her off to my bed and have my way with her every minute I'm with her, but I know she needs a little time. She's worth waiting for. Whether he liked it or not, she was definitely worth waiting for. He couldn't have found a girl better for him if he had hundreds to choose from. Elaine felt tears prick her eyes at his words. What had she done in life to deserve having a man who saw all those things when he looked at her as a husband? Thank you, she whispered. We need to sleep. A rancher's day starts early. She nodded, sleepy. She'd slept very little on the train, because being unable to straighten her leg for that long had made her too uncomfortable. Will you come home for lunch? How could she tell him that she wanted to spend every moment with him she possibly could? He nodded. I'll come home for lunch most days. I'll let you know if I won't be here, and you can pack sandwiches or something. He looked down at her. You are asking so you know if you should cook for me, right? He couldn't keep the eagerness out of his voice. She laughed softly. You don't like to eat, do you? Feeding this man would be a never-ending task, and she loved the idea of it. One of my favorite things. Kissing you is up there too. He knew that making love to her would top everything else in life, but he didn't say that to her. He didn't want to scare her off so early in their marriage. He looked down at her head pillowed on his shoulder and noticed that she'd fallen asleep, her mouth slightly open. He smiled, happy she was able to sleep in the strange location. From the way she talked, he was certain she hadn't slept in different places often in her life. When Elaine woke the following morning, she was still stiff, but her leg felt much better. She knew she needed to get up to start breakfast, but he was blocking her in. Biting her lip, she wondered if she should just wake him or try to climb over him. Finally, she put her hand on his shoulder. Colin, I need to start breakfast. The covers were down around his waist, and she did her best not to look at his bareness. He turned to her on the bed and buried his face in her neck, breathing deeply of her scent. He'd be waking to this beautiful woman beside him every morning. I'm the luckiest man alive, you know. He nipped at her neck, wishing he had the right to just make love to her. You are? The sun was rising and the red glow of the sky tinted everything in their room a pale shade of pink. He nodded. I am. I get to wake up beside you every morning for the rest of my life. She smiled, knowing he was just flattering her, but enjoying the flattery immensely. Very sweet of you to say. She couldn't help but wonder if he'd be this amorous every morning. He brushed his lips against hers before rolling away and jumping out of bed, he pulled the clothes he'd dropped the night before on with his back to her. What's for breakfast? he asked. Elaine's face was flaming red. She knew she should have turned away from him when he dressed, but she just couldn't. She enjoyed watching him too much. Eggs and bacon, she asked. She hadn't thought about what she would cook for breakfast yet. She was too busy staring at him. Sounds delicious. I'll go get the eggs and milk. He paused on his way out the door. I'll start the fire before I go, so don't worry about that. She nodded, realizing her nightgown was tangled about her waist. What if he'd pulled her to him and felt her? 
She shook her head at her prudishness and climbed from the bed. She was going to be sleeping in his arms for the rest of her life. What did it matter if he felt her naked before the date they'd set? She dressed quickly in a fresh dress and petticoat, knowing she would need to get started early if she was going to do everything that she needed to do for the day. Walking into the kitchen, she put the skillet on the stove and added the bacon strips to it. By the time the bacon was finished, Colin was back with the eggs and she mixed them up while he sat at the table watching her. Do you like coffee or tea in the mornings? she asked. He shook his head. Just milk for me. He didn't want her to think he needed her to do extra work for him. She looked over at the milk bucket and nodded. I may make myself some tea sometimes. He shrugged. That's fine. I don't care, just so you don't make me drink it. He liked coffee, but not tea. She laughed. You don't like tea? He shook his head. Not even if you add a whole cup of sugar to it. Elaine glanced at him over her shoulder. Do you have a sweet tooth? She liked to bake and would be happy to accommodate him if he did. She loved the idea of baking treats for him after the kind way he'd treated her. I do. My mother used to say that it was all she could do to keep up with my sweet tooth. She'd bake a cake, and I just wouldn't want to share even a single bite. He winked at her. I still don't want to share. She laughed. Well, it's a good thing there are just two of us, and I don't eat all that much. She looked forward to the challenge of his sweet tooth. Yup. It sure is. He watched as she carried the plates to the table, pleased to see that she was moving much more easily than the day before. Once she was seated across from him, he took her hand and prayed for them. You feeling better today? he asked as he took his first bite of eggs. She nodded. Yes, thank you. The bath and then a good night's sleep fixed me right up. I think I'm ready to tackle the list of chores I made for the day. The list was mental, but it was a long one. It was going to be a long day for her, trying to accomplish everything, and now she was going to have to make some sort of sweet as well. Don't overdo it. I don't want you hurting yourself more. Even as he said the words, he knew they were the wrong thing to say to her. Next week, when you're rested up, you can do more. I won't be treated like an invalid. Elaine thought she'd made her position clear on that the night before. I won't deliberately hurt myself, but you have to let me be the judge of what I can and can't do. You don't live inside my body. I do. Nothing set her off the way someone trying to baby her did. She needed to be able to do what she wanted and needed to do without risking censure. Her words seemed terribly provocative to him, but he knew she didn't mean them the way he was taking them. I don't mean to offend, he said softly. She sighed. I know. It's just something I'm very touchy about. I need to be allowed to live my life to the fullest. I understand. He wished he could take back the offensive words, but he knew there was no way to do it. I'll be back around noon for lunch. Will that suit you? He stood and walked around the table, leaning down to brush his lips across hers. Elaine nodded, grateful for the subject change. I'll have something ready then. She mentally scheduled her day, knowing she would probably not be able to do everything she wanted to do. As soon as he left the house, she mixed up several loaves of bread, leaving the bowl on the work table, covered by a towel while she stripped the sheets from the bed, and washed all the dirty clothes she could find. She'd never actually used a washboard and scrubbed clothes herself before, so it was a surprise to her that her muscles ached so much. She hung everything on the line before hurrying back to the kitchen to punch down the bread and divide it into individual pans. After what he'd said at breakfast, she wanted to make sure that she had some sort of dessert for him for supper. She had the ingredients for a cake, and that would work, but she had a lot to do before she was ready to bake it. While the bread was rising again, she found the cream he'd been saving and cleaned out the butter churn. 
She understood the process of churching butter and had seen it done many times, but she'd never done it herself. By the time Colin came in for lunch, her arms hurt her a great deal more than her leg did. He saw how she was moving and asked her about it. I washed the clothes, churned butter, and kneaded bread. It's a lot of work for the arms. She ached in places she'd never ached before, but she was thrilled because it meant she'd put in a hard morning's work. He chuckled softly. Been a pampered city girl for too long? He was glad her leg wasn't hurting her, but he understood that she would have to build up the muscles in her arms for the daily work she'd be doing there. She made a face. I didn't want to be a pampered city girl, but I definitely was. She didn't mind him teasing her, and she was thrilled he wasn't upset that her arms hurt. She had worried that he would want to put her in a glass case like her mother, but he seemed to think some pain was reasonable and normal. She liked that about him. She put lunch on the table, sandwiches made from salt pork and the fresh bread and butter she'd made. She sat across from him after pouring them each a glass of milk. What are you doing today? she asked after he prayed for them. Mending fences. He groaned. I hate mending fences. It's probably the worst job on a cattle ranch, but I spend more time doing it than anything else it seems. What about the winter? How do the cows eat when the snow is covering the grass? I drive out and throw hay down for them every so often. They don't have to work hard to find their food that way. He shrugged. In the winter of 85 it was so bad I lost half my cattle because of the bad snows. We're not expecting a winter like that this year. In fact, no one has ever expected a winter like that. He hated even thinking about how bad the winter was. She nodded. It was a tough winter in Massachusetts as well. She took a bite of her sandwich, watching him as he ate. She wouldn't always serve sandwiches for lunch, but with everything she'd had to do that day, it had seemed like the only logical thing. He ate it without complaining. When he was finished, he stood and put his hat back onto his head, leaning down to kiss her. Thank you for lunch. If your leg gets too sore, don't bring that washing in from the line. I can help with it when I get home. My leg is fine. Not nearly as bad as my arms are. She didn't add that she needed to prove to both of them that she could do the job. Good. Your arms will heal. I don't want you doing permanent damage to your leg. He walked toward the door, stopping with his hand on the doorknob. I'll be home about five for supper. Sounds good. I'll have something ready for you. She had no idea what, though. She'd think of something. She found she truly enjoyed keeping the house for him and cooking the meals. Yes, it was hard work and made her sore, but she felt like he'd done so much for her that she should be able to give something back. She baked a cake, made a thick stew out of the salt pork, and made the bed. She wasn't able to get down on her knees and scrub the floor as it needed, and she realized that was one thing she may never be able to do. She wasn't certain how to deal with that. She could mop, of course, but mopping never got a house as clean as scrubbing it on your hands and knees. At least that's what her maid at home said. When Colin came in at the end of the day, Elaine was sitting in the rocking chair, hemming the curtains she'd sewed. She'd done the majority of the cleaning she wanted to do, but when her leg started to hurt more than it should, she sat down to work on something that wouldn't hurt so much. He washed his hands while she got supper on the table, and he noticed she was limping worse than earlier. Once he was seated, he asked, Is your leg worse tonight, because it always is at night, or did you overdo it? She sighed, wishing he wouldn't worry so much. It's always a little worse in the evenings, but I think I overdid it a little. I stopped once it started aching so badly and worked on the curtains, though. Good. As long as you're doing what's going to keep it from hurting so much, I'm fine with that. He took her hand and prayed for them both, taking his first bite of stew. He sighed happily. This is delicious. 
You really are a good cook. He was thrilled that he'd found her in that restaurant. John was an idiot. He'd eaten half his bowl and two pieces of fresh bread when a knock came at the door. You sit. I'll see who it is. He got to his feet and went to the door, opening it wide. John. He wasn't pleased to see the other man at his house, but he knew he wanted to show off his pretty wife. I was out chasing down a cow that got free and figured you were good for a bowl of beans while I was in the neighborhood. John looked past Colin with wide eyes. You married? The shock was evident in his voice. Colin nodded, letting the other man inside. Have some stew with my wife and me. He couldn't wait until John tasted the cooking he'd given up. He wanted the other man to see what an idiot he was. Elaine went to the stove and served another bowl of the stew and carried it to the table. She placed it in front of John, who looked up at her face for the first time. John stared. You married Elaine? My bride? He was obviously astounded that anyone would want her. No, I married my bride. Colin took another bite of his stew while Elaine sat down across from him. He winked at her, letting her know that he was proud of her. Elaine's eyes met Colin's. She was terribly nervous with John there, but she wasn't certain why. The man was nothing to her, and she'd felt like she had a narrow escape by not marrying him, but he still made her skittish. Colin obviously knew what she was thinking because he winked at her again, his foot moving under the table to rub against hers in silent support. John looked from one to the other before taking a bite of his stew. I wouldn't have let you go if I knew you could cook like this. His mouth was full of stew as he spoke, and he sprayed a bit across the table, narrowly missing Elaine. You can't have her, John. She's mine now. Colin ate his stew while the other man glared at him. You didn't want her. Remember? The look he gave Elaine was filled with emotion. Elaine hid her smile with a bite of bread. She'd helped in the kitchen more times than she could count, but she'd never been the one to decide what she would cook and make the entire meal. It was a new experience for her. She mentally debated whether she should mention the cake she'd made in front of John because she didn't feel the need to cast her pearls before swine, but she had a need to make him more envious of Colin. As soon as she finished her stew, she asked, Would either of you care for a piece of cake? She was on her feet walking toward the work table as she asked. Colin's head popped up and a grin transformed his face. Yes, ma'am. In fact, there's no need to dirty a knife. Just bring me the cake and a fork. He laughed at the look on her face. John elbowed Colin. Hey, she offered me a piece too. He obviously wasn't willing to be left out of dessert. She's my wife. I don't have to share the cake. Colin smiled at her. Elaine couldn't help laughing. You decide if you want him to have a piece of cake. She knew Colin would share, but she honestly didn't care one way or the other. If he didn't want John to have a piece, she wouldn't serve him one. Colin seemed to consider it for a moment. Well, he is our guest, and the first one we've had since we married, so you can give him a small piece. Make sure mine is much bigger than his. Elaine grinned as she walked to the work table and cut them each a piece, making sure to cut Colin's piece twice the size of John's. She put the pieces in front of the men and said, I was raised to be an obedient wife. She would obey for as long as there was someone around as a witness. She ignored John's protests as she limped back to cut herself a piece as well. Colin waited until she was sitting before he took his first bite. This is wonderful. You could outcook any woman I've ever met. He closed his eyes savoring every bite. Elaine smiled. Thank you, Colin. John was still staring at his small piece of cake, obviously upset that he didn't have a piece as big as Colin's. Isn't the guest supposed to get the biggest piece? he asked. Colin looked at his neighbor. 
not when the guest was rude to my wife, before I even had a chance to meet her. He wasn't going to give in. He got the biggest piece, and that's all there was to it. John frowned. How was I rude? She lied to me. He took a bite of the cake, obviously afraid it would be taken from him. Did you ask her if she walked with a limp? Because if you asked her that, and she said no, then she lied. If you asked her if she was willing to work hard and cook, then look around you. She told the truth. Colin carefully kept his voice at an even tone and sounding reasonable. He wanted to hit the other man badly, but he wouldn't do it, because he knew it would upset Elaine. John glared over at Elaine. Why didn't you tell me you could cook like this? I'd have put up with your leg. Elaine's eyes met John's. Frankly, I'm glad you rejected me. I'm happy to have married the better man. She took her empty plate to the basin and poured in the hot water she'd been heating on the stove to wash the dishes with. As she washed them, she listened to the men talk behind her. Why did you marry her? She walks funny. John kept his voice down, but it was obvious he thought the other man was crazy for marrying her. Colin took a deep breath as he tried to control his anger. She's a beautiful woman who is already proving herself to be an excellent wife. What does it matter if she has an injury if she is a good woman? He couldn't believe the other man would insult his wife in her own home. John stood up to leave. I need to get home. You enjoy your wife. He walked to the door, slamming it behind him as he left. Colin walked up behind Elaine and wrapped his arms around her, burying his face in her neck. I couldn't have chosen a better wife. John is just upset because he realized he lost out on the wife he really wanted. Elaine didn't believe him, but she said nothing. I need to write a couple of letters home tonight. I promised the owner of the mail order bride agency and my parents I'd write as soon as I got here. Tomorrow's Sunday, and the post office is closed, but I can give them to Mr. Judd to mail for me. He won't mind. He let the topic drop, knowing that it upset her. He wished he hadn't let the other man into the house, but he'd really wanted to show him what he'd missed out on.